and, and Gary spoke about what was it, about two months ago, and uh, Sam kindly offered to do a, a talk to us this morning. So over to you, um, Sam, and um, you don't mind any questions as we go through, do you? No, not at all. So, Oli, thanks for the kind intro, and yeah, it's really great to be invited by Startup Stand Up uh, to talk about all things investing. So, I've got um, yeah a, a tendency to talk far too much. So, if anybody's got any questions, just jump in, come off mute, and ask a question as we go along. Um, yeah, I'll try and keep this to 35, 40 minutes anyway, um, and then there'll be some time for questions at the back end. So. Good morning, everybody. Um, in terms of what I hope to cover today, and I think Ollie's asked me to focus on um, the, the bottom end of this. So what will angels ask for and VCs even, and how will uh, those investors judge your startup? So what I'll do is just set the scene on you know, who I am, what Founder Catalyst does, different sources of funding. And I'm sure everybody on here probably knows that, but I'll just recap our position on that. Um, a little bit on SEIS and EIS and why it's absolutely vital to your funding round. Um, and then we'll dive into the detail of, you know, how you prepare to speak to your angels or VCs even, and then how those angels and VCs will uh, judge your business. So in terms of me, to my background, I spent the first 15 years of my career uh, as a technologist, worked in various, in a single IT company actually, went from being a junior engineer up to technical director, and that was great fun. Had no intention of being an entrepreneur. And then that company in, uh, 2013 it's called 2e2 collapse in a heap so really interesting story one not for now but um yeah had a buy and build strategy 500 million in revenue roughly 12 percent ebit so on the face of it a really really lovely company uh in reality they borrowed loads of money from private equity and bank there they breached covenants and the banks pulled the rug so a really interesting story there for a, another time i then started in 2013 an it business called rock technologies that grew from zero to 27 million in three years. Uh, won loads of awards, things like Sunday Times Tech Track became second fastest growing company in the UK, and then uh, FT 17th fastest growing company in Europe. That got us on the roadmap with lots of uh, private equity. So we started a conversation. I had no interest at all in staying in a PE back bank debt laden business because I'd already been through that. So um, me and one of my co-founders exited, leaving the other two co-founders there to do a buy and build strategy again. So it came to 2017 and I'd exited my first business and uh, I did the usual thing of buying too many watches and cars and got bored really quickly. So I started angel investing because I thought it was a useful thing to do um, and also would be a useful way to deploy some capital. And I really, really enjoyed it um, over the last four years. Uh, I've made 26 investments now, actually, actually. And I have a really, really strong preference for early stage SEIS type uh, investments. Um, and then in 2020, I, I became an intentional entrepreneur, started two other companies, found a catalyst, which I'll, is not a sales pitch, but I'll tell you a little bit, a bit more about on the next slide. And then Forge Technologies, which is yet another IT company. So in terms of what found a catalyst does, um, we essentially do three things, and I'll bring it to life with a case study because I think the Kelpie case study is pretty amazing. Um, so the first thing we do is help uh, startups get SEIS and EIS advanced assurance. And we'll come on to in a minute why that's really, really vital that um, startups get that as soon as possible. We also do all of the funding round paperwork associated with uh, doing, a, doing your first, second or third funding round. Things like uh, shareholder agreement, articles of association, founder service agreement, and all those kind of documents. There's about a dozen documents uh, in total you need to complete a funding round. So to bring to life the case study, um, uh, Neil Morris approached us, he's the CEO of Kelpie. They make uh, recyclable uh, biodegradable plastic from seaweed. And they've got somebody who's got a PhD in seaweed, uh, who's a professor at Bath University. And... They wanted to do their first funding round. They realized they needed SEIS and EIS advanced assurance. They approached Founder Catalyst. I really, really love this business. It's got such a credible founding team uh, and such a brilliant mission. You know, it's a very old message, the kind of green angle. Um, so we help them get SEIS, EIS advanced assurance. We create all of their funding round paperwork, but we also made some introductions. So we've got a really good network across the co-founders of Founder Catalyst. We made a, an introduction to Bristol Private Exit Club, they were only doing a £150,000 race, but actually BPEC committed £180,000, which turned into a dual SEIS-EIS round. Um, in addition, uh, BPEC introduced 
uh, Kelpie to Set Squared in Bristol. And uh, thanks to that introduction, Kelpie got £80,000 Set Squared Raya grant funding as well, which was, which was amazing. Um, yeah, and so, I, like I say, I love that prison so much, I even invested myself. So that's a really good case study of what we do. Get people SCI, CIS Advanced Assurance, create and create the paperwork for a funding round and manage that funding round journey, um, and then make introductions to investors who hopefully will potentially invest. So that's a bit about what we do. I wanted to take a step back and look at the funding round landscape in the UK. Um, and typically these are split into two kind of camps. Um, you've got debt-based solutions and loads of founders think they'll go for a, a debt-based funding solution to start with and then they realise lots of these um, are just unpalatable for various reasons. So for example, lots of people go to the bank and try and take a bank loan. They speak to the bank and everything sounds good and the interest rates are low at the money so it sounds like really cheap money but then you realise halfway through that conversation that actually uh, bank debt comes with personal guarantees. So your business is the primary guarantor but um, the bank will also expect personal guarantees from each of the directors of the business. And effectively, what this means is if the business doesn't work out, you can't repay the bank debt, the business folds, but then that you are on the hook and the bank will pursue you for um, any leftover uh, debt that hasn't been repaid. And, and ultimately, and this is not a scare tactic, it genuinely happens, you could lose your house if the business and you fail to repay the debt. So people kind of look through the debt solutions and realize actually it's not such a great idea. We've got some stuff in the middle. Um, and you know, if a business is eligible for grants and you know, innovate, give out thousands of grants every year, then you should absolutely, absolutely apply for grants. They are non-dilutative, you don't give away equity, and effectively it's free money as long as you um, deliver uh, you know, a, a, an approved program with that grant funding agency. Um, the challenge with grants these days is they're very, very, very competitive. So a few years ago, you'd only get a handful of people applying for each grant. These days, the number of uh, applicants for any grant is, is pretty huge. So your chance of success is limited. Um, we then move on to equity solutions. And uh, we'll, on the next slide, we'll talk through the typical flow of this. But you guys would have heard of people like Crowdfeud, Crowdfeud and Cedars. That's the top equity crowdfunding. Family and friends is a great way to, um, you know, to get your business off the ground. You then move on to angels and then groups of angels and then venture capital. Sure. Sorry, Sam, just to interrupt quickly. Um, we're not seeing the slides. I did share my, my screen with you earlier. Okay, that would be that would be a probably useful useful place to start. Can everybody see those now? Yeah, got it. Got it. Perfect. Good stuff. Lovely. Okay, well, that was me talking away. Uh, on the assumption you can see the slides. Um, yeah, so, so th this is the debt and equity solution I've just talked through. Um, so if we focus and the rest of this conversation is going to be around equity solutions, it may be that your business is already, um, yeah, already has a product that it's selling. It may be actually invoice factoring is a potential solution, but um, yeah, in most cases, you'll be looking at equity solutions. So an equity journey typically looks at this. Um, so on the left-hand side, Typically, you'll bootstrap the business yourself. That means that you're paying for bills and not taking a salary yourself to try and get some uh, momentum in the business. Um, you will then, you'll then potentially speak to family and friends who may want to invest in your business. They can potentially invest under SEIS and EIS, though there are some interesting rules around family members and SEIS, but generally there's a way to work around that. Um, typically, in those kind of deals, it will be uh, you'll produce all of the paperwork yourself, you'll produce uh, the terms that the investment's under, and it will be really um, founder friendly. So the terms will be on your terms effectively. Um, moving around a bit, you'll then uh, take on investment from angels. And in practice, there's no difference between friend and, friend and family and angels. It's just somebody external to your organization buying equity, usually under an SEIS or EIS scheme. Um, but here, because there's no uh, existing relationship with the angels, you'll typically find that the um, terms are slightly more punchy than friends and family. So they they may ask, may ask for um, some legal terms that friends and family wouldn't. You then move around to funds and angel networks. These are effectively groups or syndicates of angel investors who invest as a group or under a club. Typically, they'll sit on the cap table as individuals. So they yeah. 
Um, but this is where, um, so I mentioned Bristol Private Equity Club before, they are um, one of the biggest investors in the Southwest and they have legal counsel as part of the team. They will be much more diligent about reading the paperwork. They will negotiate standard terms like board investor rights and investor consents and, uh, um, and things like that. You then move around to crowdfunding. Uh, everybody knows about CrowdPeed and Cedars. Certain beta C businesses do really, really well on crowdfunding. Um, but we won't delve on that too much. But effectively, investors via those platforms can still make use of SCRS and EIS. Um, and, and it is just like having lots and lots of angels committing a very small amount of money. Um, you then move on to proper big boy VCs. And uh, these are institutional investors. At this point, it is very likely that SEIS and EIS won't be eligible. It is institutions investing the money rather than in individuals. What you'll find here is the commercial terms are much more aggressive than any of the other options. So one of the real benefits of, for founders of using SEIS and EIS is that it ties the hands of investors to the type of terms that they can ask for so you can't you're not allowed liquidation preferences or anti-dilution or um very very different types of shares because that's just not allowed under the seis and the is legislation as soon as you get to vc all of those things are open and you'll typically find that the terms you accept from vc are much more uh, stringent than the terms you accept from anybody else on that list but the benefit of going to a vc is Generally, they write very big checks, you know, over a million is, is very common. And the pre-money valuation um, that that investment will be under will be much, much higher than an angel or um, an angel network would invest in. So it, it, now's probably a good time for me to take a breath and ask, are there any questions at all on what we've covered so far? Gary? Gary. Yeah, uh, Sam, uh, probably two questions. Uh, one is, uh, equity split in these rands what is the the rough if you know what i mean like do you give up five percent friends and family ten percent angels and then you get to vcs and you give up a lot less percentage but a higher valuation yeah uh, so that would be one question and the second question is this roadmap is all funding but it doesn't show is there a profitable side of this where you can do this before you go get vc money as well because not all companies are heading for the big money. They might drop off after the angels and actually become profitable. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's that's a really good point. So let me ask answer your first point. It, and there are, you know, there are um, no standards really around how much you can raise at what value and what percentage of the company you give away at each of these stages. But there are averages, and there's a brilliant Bowhurst report. Um, which indicates you know, the first funding round, so your very first round, whether it's friends and family or more typically angels, you know, typically your valuation will be somewhere around you know, between one and one and a half million, sometimes up to two million if you can prove lots of traction. And, and typically you would look to give away on any of these funding rounds around 15 to 20% of your business. <coughs> um, so that's a really good indication of how much you should be raising at what valuation at each of these stages. Typically with VC, you would again try and give away 10 to 15% of the business, um, no more than that. And but but obviously because your valuation is taking a big jump at that point, you're giving away relatively, you're you're getting a lot more money for your 10 or 15% at that stage. And if I can a, a slight sidetrack, lots of founders that I speak to say, right, well, I need, I've done a forecast, I need two million pounds over the next four years. So I'm going to raise two million pounds up front. And um, which in theory sounds great. In practice, A, you're never going to get the two million pounds because your business may not be worth even two million pounds. Um, but B, the two, even if you could get the two million pounds, that is really expensive money. So when you, the earlier your business is, the less proof points it's reached. So you may not have an MVP, you may not have paying customers, you may not have proof product market fit, you know, it may not be scaling, you know, all of those things. So your valuation before you hit all of those items is relatively low. So that's why people stagger their funding round into different kind of legs of the journey. They'll do their first round at a pre-money valuation, say of 1.5 million and just raise, you know, 200, 250,000. They'll then uh, use that money to get to MVP point or even better, maybe have the first paying customers. And then they'll do another funding round. And because you've reached that proof point of having 
either a launch product or paying customers or whatever it happens to be, your valuation jumps from one and a half million on the first round up to say two and a half million in the second round. So when you take half a million at two and a half million valuation, that is much cheaper money than when you took, did your first round. And that is why people tiered around. So, um, sorry, remind me what the second question was. It, um, it was more of a question of, this is showing all the funding rounds, like profitability, can you drop off or should you aim to drop off? before you get to VCs, crowdfunding? Yeah, because absolutely, yeah. If you can, I mean, the, the aim, your aim as an owner should be to get to profitability, you know, run rate profitability as soon as you can, and to take the least amount of funding as you can to get there. And the reason for that is you keep, that means you keep more of the equity yourself. So, um, yeah, a, a successful business. I mean, in the business, uh, the IT business that I grew, we didn't take a pound of funding. And that means that when we came to an exit before, founding directors owned 100% of the equity. If we'd have taken, if we'd have followed some of this journey, then we would have diluted uh, our shareholding. We may have been able to accelerate the business growth, but we'd have diluted our shareholding and our proceeds from the exit would have been less. So um, absolutely, you know, you should only raise as much money as you need at any point. And as soon as you reach the point of being cash flow positive, you should, you know, uh, unless you want more, a big chunk of cash in order to, you know, ramp up marketing or sales or whatever, you should look to step off this funding round journey as soon as possible. Um, it, it's, just, sorry. I was going to say, it's quite funny, Sam, that the world of uh, startups, you're sort of spoken into to go get money and keep getting money. But actually, it's a sign of failure in a way because it, no one yeah, comes out and says, we was profitable after the first year and you can't get any PR for that. So people actually use the VC rounds as a PR uh, event and actually they're firstly showing failure as well as success aren't they yeah because the success of a business absolutely should be reaching cash flow positive uh, you know being able to grow that uh, using uh, the company's funds rather than borrowing the funds because that's a really you know equity in the long run assuming you hit a successful exit giving away exits um, giving away equity is a painful thing to do um, but but the necessity lots of you know there are tens and tens of thousands of businesses in the uk that that wouldn't have even started if the equity wasn't an option. So, um, um, so in terms of... So can I just interrupt there, Sam? I've got one of more course. question. Sorry, it's Sangeeta here. Um, how easy is it to get SEIS status without uh, expert help? Uh, it's absolutely positive. Uh, it's absolutely possible, sorry. Um, and, and I'll talk through that. If I, if I flip through <laughs> a couple of slides and I'll talk you through the process, you absolutely can do it on your own. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it is possible. There are loads of pitfalls and gotchas. And the problem with SEIS advanced assurance is that, um, yeah, if you get something slightly wrong in your application, then you may get a query back. You'll get a query back from HMRC saying, could you explain this or you've missed this detail? But if you get, if you make a misstep and you get it catastrophically wrong, then HMRC will just deny you advanced assurance on your business. So they will refuse advanced assurance. There's no right, because advanced assurance isn't a legal, risk, legal obligation for HMRC, there's no right to appeal. So they will just write you a letter saying, we don't think you're eligible for advanced assurance. There's no right to appeal. And that's that. Um, and, and that means, you know, you probably won't get funding for your business. So it's pretty catastrophic if you get it wrong, which is why lots of people decide to use either their accountants or us or whatever to, to do that submission. And interestingly, Advanced Assurance is um, free via Founder Catalyst, so it's not a service we charge for at all, at all um, because we realise it's absolutely vital, uh, you know, to get that in place. Oh, OK. In that case, we'll chat later. Let's do that, yes. Um, so in terms of what, what we've got here is the, um, the, the sparsest path to get funded. So we've missed out lots on here about, you know, products and... Uh, customers and all of those kind of good things. That's not what we're focusing at all. But this is the critical path to go from having a bright idea through to closing your first angel round. And I won't spend too much time on this, but um, yeah, there are things that you've probably all done anyway, which is pick a name, get a registered address of some kind, incorporate your business, get a bank account, which actually is a prerequisite for getting advanced assurance in place. Um, you then need, in order to get advanced assurance, the two key documents that you need to produce and the things that always take 10 times longer than you'd hope are the pitch deck and the three-year forecast model. Um, one of the services we offer, again for free, 
is um, a review of your pitch deck and forecast model to make sure, A, you know, do they resonate with me as an angel investor? Do they uh, tick all the boxes? Do they answer all the questions for an angel investor? But also we'll put a HMRC hat on and say, do they answer all of the things that HMRC expect to see? Things like, you know, uh, use of funds, capital at risk, genuine growth company, all of those kind of things you need to bring to life in those two documents. So we'll help you do those review. Um, you then, in parallel with producing those, you'll be looking for and engaging with investors, bearing in mind that um, most angel investors won't have a serious conversation with startups until they can see advance assurances in place. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. So um, a few years ago, there was a 95% success rate for advance assurance. Um, and then HMRC tweaked the rules a few years ago to make it more difficult. Um, and now there's about a one third of advanced assurance applications fail, which means that your business is not eligible for SEIS and or EIS. So um, investors could spend a whole bunch of time speaking to um, founders and then find out, you know, there's a one in three chance that the business won't get advanced assurance and therefore the investors would realistically never invest. So loads of investors and virtually all private equity clubs and angel networks are insisting that advanced assurance is in place before they'll even start a serious conversation. Um, so actually the submission to HMRC for advanced assurance is really straightforward. Once you've got your ducks in a row, you need to produce a pack with about a dozen documents. Um, you email that to HMRC and depending on uh, how busy HMRC are, and, and they've been ridiculously busy during Corona, they move staff out of that team into other teams to help with um, various other parts of HMRC. So, so they're, they're, it was taking up to two months to get advanced assurance. But these days, you know, it's about a week or two to get a response from HMRC. Um, all being well, and once you get that, you're then at a point you can take on angel investment. And really, that's at the point where you can engage um, successfully with angel, <coughs> um, with angel investors. <clears throat> so a really quick uh, in, introduction to why angel investors exist and the benefits from your side. So really, the only benefit... Um, for SEIS and EIS for a business is that they can attract investors. And we'll come on to why SEIS and EIS are ridiculously attractive for angel investors. Um, but why should your business seek funding for angel investors? Um, you know, it's capital injection, obviously. Sometimes you get an angel investor that can bring relevant experience or knowledge into your business. Uh, quite often, angel investors are happy to become a board member. So they'll work as a non-executive director and sit on your board which strengthens your team slide in your pitch deck, but also brings that valuable experience to bear. Um, and what you find as a startup, because of the rules of SEIS and EIS are so rigid, the terms that an angel investor will demand from you, you know, they must be much weaker than what a, a kind of VCB would. So that's why the money from angels is really attractive. Um, looking at the benefits just for two minutes of SEIS and EIS. So SEIS is on the left and EIS is on the right. Um, so if you're, um, if, if I'm an angel investor investing 10,000 in your 10,000 pounds in your business via SEIS, um, then the instantly virtually, uh, I put the 10,000 pounds into your business. I can claim 5,000 pounds as tax relief. So I'm getting 50% of my money back, which is, uh, which is brilliant. Um, if the business go sells really, really well and exits after, uh, the qualifying period of three years. And if you continue to meet all of the rules of SEIS, um, then the increase in value on my shares. So if I invest ten thousand pounds, say the shares grow, my shares grow to a hundred thousand pounds at the point you exit. Then there's no capital gains tax, no entrepreneur relief, no nothing on the increase between ten thousand pounds and hundred thousand pounds. So no no tax to pay on the increase at all. And as long as I hold the shares for at least two years, there's no inheritance tax to pay either. Should I die whilst holding the shares? If the business doesn't go so well. Um, then there's also loss, re loss relief for the investors. Now, the amount of loss relief depends uh, based upon my tax status at the time, but it's roughly £2,700. So I've already got £5,000 and I get another £2,700 back. So I'm actually risking just um, £3,200 out of £10,000 investment. So absolutely amazing. EIS is depicted on the right. It's the, lots of the rules around CGT and inheritance tax are exactly the same. Um, the upfront relief isn't £5,000, isn't 50%, it's 30% in the case of EIS. Other than that, the schemes are nearly identical. Um, typically, a business will raise SEIS first, up to a maximum of £150,000, 
and then they will move on to EIS investment. And those, the amount you can raise under EIS is many million, so that's a much higher level. Um, so the, the next question, it, I wonder if there are any questions on SEIS and EIS before I rattle through to the next section. No, okay. Um, so the, the, what I wanted to cover next is um, just an introduction really into the top four things an angel investor will ask for. So if you haven't done a funding round yet, you're probably wondering, well, how do I engage with angels? Where do I find them? What are they gonna ask me and how are they gonna judge my, um, how are they gonna judge my startup? So in terms of the things they will ask you for, and this is just pretty universal. The first thing is a pitch deck. So everybody knows what a pitch deck is. Um, so I'm not gonna labor this point too much, but you know, um, the, the pitch deck should be detailed enough so that it is a standalone document. Um, so you should be able to send it to them. You can't assume that you'll get the opportunity to talk through a pitch deck page by page because sometimes an angel will just ask for it and they will decide whether to have a follow-up conversation with you or not based upon that standalone um, pitch deck. Back in, you know, a few years ago, it was standard that every single startup, even a first funding round, had a full business plan. Uh, these days, that's no longer necessary. HMRC don't ask for it for advanced assurance purposes. And most angel investors for a first funding round won't expect to see a pitch deck, uh, sorry, a business plan. As you go to do second, third or fourth rounds, then increasingly, you know, the chances are you will need to produce that. But for a first funding round, you can avoid writing a 70 page document that nobody will read anyway. Um, Just on that point, sir, how long or how many pages or slides should a pitch deck have? Uh, it should be long enough. Um, <laughs> that is to say, it should, you know, bring to life your opportunity. It should cover all of the standard points. You know, what is the problem you're addressing? What is your solution? What's the market and opportunity? What is the team? What are you going to? How much are you asking for, and what are you can do with it? What is the competition? What is the IP protection? And, and you know, the the size and shape of the pitch deck will vary quite a bit depending on your business but typically you know anything less than 15 pages it's really unlikely you've answered all the exam questions okay um anything more than 25 pages and you know people are going to lose interest but there are genuinely you know some deep tech companies doing really you just freeze uh, a little bit, Sam. Uh, good. Am I back? You are. Ah, brilliant. So, so yeah, so yeah, somewhere between you know fifteen and twenty pages is probably optimal. And there are you know, and all of the slide decks, every good slide deck follows a standard set of flows. That I could, I can share some notes on what I look look for after this, um, yeah, after this presentation. Um, the second document is the term sheet. Now the term sheet details the key aspects of the funding round. So how much are you raising? When's the round going to close? What's the valuation? Is it SEIS, EIS eligible? What does the current cap table look like? Um, and it distills down all of the key terms of the document, uh, uh, of, the, of the longer form documents that will form the funding round. So, um, you know, what are the preemption rights? What are the drag and tag rights? Are you offering investor consents and those kind of things? So it's quite a detailed document. Um, in the majority, it's not legally binding. So just because you offer a term sheet and somebody signs it, it doesn't mean that you're obliged to take funding uh, from them. And it doesn't mean that they're obliged to, take, uh, to, to invest in your business. But it's kind of an intent. And what you're doing here is agreeing the very high level principles of the investment so that you, know, you don't get further down the road and find that they're negotiating the bits that have already been agreed. Um, on the Found Out Catalyst platform, you can create a company for free, you can set up all the details, create a funding round, and, and you can produce a term sheet for free as well. So you can get to see what a term sheet would look like for your business. The third document is a financial forecast. So firstly, you need one of these because um, HMRC will ask for it. It's a mandatory part of the submission for advanced assurance. Um, but, but secondly, angel investors typically will want to look through this to make sure that your revenue, sales, and cost predictions of the business are realistic over a period. And they'll want to work out, you know, the, the types of the, the different streams of revenue you have in their business and how each of those flows through to the PL. Um, we've got a really good template that we offer at Founder Catalyst that ju just covers sufficient detail um, for both of those purposes. So we see 
when we do forecast document reviews, sometimes we see these documents and they are, you know, 30 slides generally, sorry, 30 tabs in an Excel spreadsheet. And they cover things like balance sheet movements and court tax and VAT and all of those kind of things. For the purpose of HMRC and early stage investors, you don't need to worry about all of that. Um, it's really showing the key revenue, costs, overheads, incoming investments, and then kind of a rolling cash flow. Um, and it, it, yeah, so our model is as complex as it needs to be to get through the process and no more. Um, the last document is proof of SEIS, EIS advanced assurance. And I think I've mentioned this before, because there's a one in three chance that you're not going to get advanced assurance from HMRC, virtually every investor these days asks for proof of advanced assurance. Um, yeah, before um, uh, before a lab, before they will start taking a, a serious look at your business. So now is probably a good place to pause. Is there any questions on what we've just covered in terms of pitch deck, forecast, term sheet, or advanced assurance? I think we're good, Sam. Very good. Okay. So um, and this is the part that Ollie has asked me to focus on today, which is around how do angel investors pick an investment? And uh, this little spider diagram, I think, brings to life. And you know, every it's worth mentioning, angels are individuals uh, themselves, and every angel investor will have a slightly different bias on what they prefer. So, uh, as an example, you know, I focus on you know the first three important things for me in a, in a startup that I look at are team, team, and team. Because if you've got a brilliant team, but a slightly, you know, an idea that turns out to be slightly off the money, then the team will be bright enough to pivot, try to slightly change their direction and make the business a success anyway. Whereas if you get even a brilliant idea and a bad team, they won't be able to execute and they'll fall out and things will, uh, things will go badly. So personally, I focus, you know, I spend most of my time uh, doing due diligence, actually focusing. The first thing I look at is, do I like the team? Do I think they're credible? Have they got relevant experience, both in the sector and also running a startup? Um, have they got a broader team? So not just the founding directors, but do they have advisors and NEDs and a chairman maybe that can support them on their journey? Does that team look well-rounded? Do they cover all the bases? Are there any gaps? And, and it's, you know, I can't overstate how important attitude and passion is. I saw an amazing opportunity a few years ago. It was uh, an agritech AI based business. And, you know, that business on the face of it should be eminently investable. I spoke to the founders and I just couldn't, you know, I had no faith that they would execute on it. So I walked to it, it was SCIS, it was very low valuation. There was lots of things to love about that business, but I, I just couldn't bring myself to invest in it. So team is absolutely the first thing you need to bring to life in your pitch deck but also make sure you've got the right size and shape of team. And there is a big debate amongst angel investors, and this is where angel investors don't agree on what the optimal number of founders in a team is. Some people, some angel investors, absolutely won't invest in a business with just one founder. They, you know, they can't bring themselves to do it. And that is because um, it is really unlikely that single founder can cover all of the you know, customer facing and technology and operational areas. And there's a really high chance that a sole founder will burn out and not reach the end goal. Similarly, I've seen startups with five or six uh, co-founders, and that's just too many. That you know, there will be lots of overlap in what those founders do. Um, the, the more founders you have, the more chance of disharmony and fallouts and things like that. So most angel investors agree that two or three founders is about optimal. Um, you can see the other items here. So, uh, like I say, I focus on team a lot because it is absolutely essential to me. Um, the other area, so, you know, personally, I look at potential exit and I want to ensure that any business that I invest in, you know, can get, there's a potential at least of getting a five times multiple on investment. If it's, if it's any less than that, then I would usually not be interested. And that is because it's, it's not because I'm greedy, but that is because if I make 10 investments, then three or four of those are going to fail. So they won't reach their end goal. I, I'll get my, you know, I'll potentially you know, just lose 30% because of the SEIS scheme, but I certainly won't make an increase in my capital expended. So to offset those three or four that fail, you've got to get a good return on some others in the portfolio. And at the high end, you know, the, the reason, yeah, the reason people do this is looking for the really high multiples and exit. So it's not atypical, um, you know, to get 20 plus times return on your money for a really good investment. And that's really where an angel investor and VCs earn their money is that 
it's called the power law, is those really good investments that do 20, 30, 40, or 100 times the money you invest. Um, uh, we've mentioned forecast. That's one of the key documents people will look at. People will sanity check. Is it a realistic forecast? You know, if you're saying you're going to sell to every single customer in your target market in the UK, that is not going to be, that is not realistic. If your price point is much higher than all of your competitors, that is not realistic either. So people will look through the forecast. They'll check, validate that the sal salary assumptions are correct and things like that. Um, in terms of proposition, and again, this is where lots of angels differ, but some angels really, really, and lots of angels really, really love SaaS-based platforms because they are eminently scalable. You're not producing anything. You don't have scalability issues. If you have a SaaS platform, you can turn on more compute at AWS and you can you know, triple the size of your market literally overnight. Um, angels and uh, angels really like reoccurring revenue. So um, if you're a product-based business where you sell something to one customer and then you need to sell it to somebody else, well, that's okay if it's high enough margin, but actually, you know, selling is really, really hard. I think in, in most businesses and every business I've, I've been involved with, selling is the hardest part of running the business compared with everything else. Um, if you can have reoccurring or annuity revenue so that every single month you are charging a set fee, um, then that's brilliant. It means that every single month you're not having to, your, you know, sales in number isn't resetting to zero. You've got um, so much already committed um, within that reoccurring revenue bucket. Tractions and proof points. So we spoke about this briefly earlier, but um, you know, lots of founders go out to raise money and they have nothing but a bright idea and a shiny pitch deck. And that is absolutely fine. Lots of people do that. Lots of people raise funds successfully. What you will find is that your valuation will be very low at that point. So if you've got a shiny pitch deck and a bright idea, but nothing, no MVP, no technology bill, no customers, you, your valuation will be to, you know, at the lower end of the expectation. So you, your valuation will be something between one and one and a half million roughly. Um, but if you can prove uh, some traction, so you've got an MVP bill, you've got pilot customers, maybe even paying customers, it, even if you reach cash flow positives, then each of those steps along the journey means that your, um, your business will look more attractive to angel investors and therefore your valuation should increase, the amount you raise should increase as well. Um, then at the bottom right, you've got details around the deal. And we've mentioned valuation. Um, quite often, founders have very unrealistic expectations. You know, right, so I'm doing my first funding round. I've looked at sil Silicon Valley uh, valuations. People are raising, you know, $1 million at a 10 million valuation when you've just got a bright idea and a shiny pitch deck. And it's true in Silicon Valley that happens. In the UK, it absolutely doesn't. Um, and you just need to be realistic with your valuation. And probably, you know, a nice way of, uh, a nice way of sanity checking your valuation is to speak to a few angels. So reach out, find some friendly angels on LinkedIn. I routinely just have catch up conversations with people and you can tell they're testing me on valuation. Um, but it's worth just, just seeing whether your valuation aspirations are anywhere near correct. Um, again, the deal, SEIS and EIS is essential um, for angel investors, even for family and friends and crowdfunding. When you get to VC, it's absolutely not relevant. But for those early stage investments, it, it most certainly will be. And then you, get, you come around to the other negotiable terms, and um, those are all held in i kind of covered those within the term sheets but that's where people will assess um, your negotiable terms um, so what does a typical uh, angel investment process look like so i've borrowed um i helped produce the uh selection process for bristol private equity club um so this is their details and typically it follows this you know this funnel approach so um when you approach BPEC, you go into the pre-qualification section they will ask you in, uh, immediately for a copy of pitch deck, a business plan potentially, your term sheet and your three year forecast. They will also ask to see your advance assurance to prove that you've got that. If you haven't, then they'll say, go and get your advance assurance in place and come back. Um, typically at this point, they'll go for a scoring matrix where a couple of people will look at your opportunity and mark you against everything that we've discussed on this slide. So team, exit, potential, um, how much traction today, how much IP competitive, competitive and defensibility you've got, and what does the deal look like? So put all of those in a matrix and then score. Um, 
if you're successful, so if your score is sufficient and if there are sufficient interest in members, then you'll go through to the next stage, which is due diligence. <clears throat> and this is um, most private equity clubs and even most angels have a standard DD process. They've got a standard 15, 20 things they'll look for on the term sheet that, uh, that you know, they will insist are in place. They will um, look at the hygiene factors in your business just to make sure everything's being well run. On the basis you're successful with that, then, then uh, go through a negotiation phase. And typically this would be um, debating about the pre-money valuation and some of the other key, uh, key terms, whether they're a board observer rights and things like that. Um, then they'll get to the point of finalizing commitment from members. So how much are the members of the organization willing to invest? Um, and that will, um, that negotiation phase ends in a non-binded consolidator offer in the investment, which is typically a letter which says, as long as you do A, B and C, we're going to invest X hundred thousand at a valuation of Y. Um, you then go through a final closing phase, which is, yeah, it's just paperwork really. Uh, typically this will be um, the uh, founder issuing all of the long form paperwork. So the shareholders agreement and articles, founder service agreement and IP assignment, all of those documents are entirely standard across every funding round. And that, those are the documents we produce via founder catalyst. Um, and then it's a matter of negotiating any final points there, but you should have done the heavy lifting by agreeing the term sheet and then going through a signing process. And that is uh, in 40 minutes, the uh, process of doing an angel investment funding round. So that is everything that I had hoped to cover on the session today. Um, and I'm happy now to open to questions. Um, that was uh, wonderful and a, a, a great uh, overview of uh, a very, very to uh, important topic, an essential topic that uh, we all need to look at. Now, any questions, guys? Anyone? Yeah, <laughs> me. Um, Sam, uh, can I just ask you something? You touched on uh, crowdfunding there, and you mentioned something which some of us may have come across in the past. Um, you suggested that it was perhaps more relevant for B2C businesses. Yes. Um, and uh, that's certainly been my experience. Would it be fair also to say that unless, if it's a B2B business, if it is extremely straightforward and represents a B2B opportunity that almost anybody could understand, then that's fine. If it's not that, unless you bring your own funders to the party, you may struggle. Is that a fair summary? No, I think that's absolutely right. So, um, and I don't, I don't want to appear snooty about crowdfunding investors, but they're generally slightly less sophisticated than, than typical angels. Um, you know, and their ticket size is lower and they, uh, quite rightly, they distribute their, you know, if they want to invest £10,000, they'll put £1,000 in 10 companies to spread the risk, which is absolutely right from an investing perspective. What you typically find, that the companies that do really, really well in crowd coupon seeders are those B2C businesses that people can understand. So Brewdog's a great example. Brewdog yeah. have a really strong brand. Um, uh, yeah, and, and they're a really, everybody understands beer, everybody understands Brewdog's segue into opening venues and, and things like that. So it's a really understandable thing. Whereas if you've got a deep tech AI commodities trading business, you know, your average, uh, your average Crowdcube fund is gonna scratch their head and, you know, you, the, yeah, they won't get emotionally attached. They won't understand it quite so instantly. And they'll move on to something that they do understand, which is fine. And, and it is absolutely horses for courses. But if you've, yeah, a B2C business typically does very, very well on crowd Um uh, Yeah, and it's, it's the right avenue. It's, it's understanding the right avenue for the right type of business we're in. Thanks, Thanks. Uh, Sam. Uh, question from Gary there. Sam, is there a, a preference of, uh, as a new startup, when you form the company, as in, if a startup comes to you and they've been formed uh, a month ago or two months ago, would that stop you from investing or is that like a friend upon? No, not at all. I think, um, yeah, as long as, as long as it is open and clear, the stage of the business, you know, sometimes you get founders, and I've, I've seen it myself, 
I've invested in them myself. Sometimes you get founders that have done a whole bunch of work before incorporating. So um, I invested a few years ago in a company that use AI for commodities forecasting, an amazing, amazing technology. The founder's got a PhD in AI and was a hedge fund trader. So absolutely completely investable. At the point that I first met him, he hadn't incorporated, but he'd done lots of work building the platform in his own time. Um, it, it was at that point that he realized, right, I'm going to go out and get angel funding. So he needed to get advanced assurance, which means he needed to have incorporated and done a bunch of other stuff. But personally, I think, uh, yeah, I'm, you could have incorporated yesterday, applied for advanced assurance the next day. And as long as you've got that, that's absolutely fine. It doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. Um, and the opposite is true as well. You know, sometimes you get people who created a business three years ago, they incorporated it, it went dormant for a bit, and then they look for investment after that. As long as it's within the timescales uh, for the SEIS and EIS rules, then yeah, that's absolutely fine. I don't mind that either. Yeah, and, and just on a similar note, if if the share structure changes just before going and get investment, does that highlight anything, or would that stop investment? Not, not typically. I mean, there's um, by going through the process of getting investment, you do um, the process called warranties and disclosure, which I won't go into to, to today because if you haven't seen it, it's pretty. Um, yeah it's pretty confusing but what that does is drive out all of the funnies in a cap table you will be asked lots of things in the warranty process around you know who owns the share capital and um yeah have you got any warrants or options or convertible loan notes so all of those things will be answered um i mean the biggest problem i see with cap table by far the biggest problem i see with cap table is you know it's a company with two founders and the founders have given given themselves one share each um, so the first thing you need to do before you can take on any investment is to do a share split, a one to 10,000 share split or whatever, to make sure there's sufficient shares in cir circulation so you can give out granular investment. So that is the problem that I absolutely see, you know, in 50% of our companies at least. Um, I, yeah, I don't think there's a big problem as long as the cap table is in a consistent state at the point of investment. And as long as, you know, if there are loads of weird and wonderfuls on there, if there are loads of different share classes for no reason, if they've got alphabet shares, if they've got, you know, ASAs and convertible loan notes and options and warrants and all those kind of things, that would, you know, you kind of have to dig into what all of that meant. Um, but in principle, if they've just done a filing and creating some new shares two days before the investment, I don't really care. Um, gotcha. Thank you. So there's a, a, a note from Graham who's had to leave. Um, he's looking at striking a conversation with you, getting in contact with you, because he's got a couple of people he wants to introduce to you. And he's saying as well, I'm guessing that we both know Mark uh, Gofflin, uh, well, from your uh, two two and rock background. There was something there from... Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> That's a conversation to have, yes. Indeed. The small world, but uh, Graham, Graham will be in touch. Are there any other questions from any other members at all? Gareth. Hi, uh, Sam. Fantastic and enlightening presentation. Thank you, uh, as as advertised. Um, the um, there's a rising uh, trend towards founders taking secondaries at the point at which they or, or um, exercising secondaries uh, at the time at which they take maybe VC investment or they get to a subsequent Series A. Probably outside the scope of this um, presentation, but is there anything that a founder with that ambition? might want to be thinking of in their articles or in their initial documentation to permit them to do that later? And do you think it raises any red flags in this current environment? So, well, that's a really interesting question. I've not been asked that one before. Um, so, uh, yeah, but so to reframe that question is, this is a founder who has a bunch of equity themselves. For the first few rounds, they absolutely wouldn't do it. But when they come to take VC cash, they cash in some of their shares as part of a VC investing, so they can take some money off the table. Um, I mean, in principle, and, you know, with my angel hat on, I have no problem with that. The thing is, um, Gareth, you wouldn't know at the start of the process anyway. So as an angel, when I'm investing, I don't know what their aspirations are there. Um, as an investor, there is a protection that I would want that probably a founder wouldn't want, um, which is called co-sale rights. And what that effectively means is if a founder sells 10% of their shares, I should be able to sell 10% of my shares as well as an investor. Um, now, you know, there is an interesting tension in lots of the things we're discussing where a founder will want 
will not want investors to have that right. And as an investor, I probably would so that I can benefit from that secondary sale to the same extent a founder does. Um, but I mean, it, yeah, it's the point that I invest during SEIS, that wouldn't even be a conversation. It's, you know, further down the line when they, you know, maybe their second or third funding, sorry, their third or fourth funding round, that, uh, yeah, they would have the conversation with VC. Typically at that point, unless there are co-sale rights, an angel investor wouldn't have any say in it. It's a deal between the angel and the VC. And there is a really interesting dynamic that most angels don't think about, and ditto founders actually, where, you know, on an early stage investment, you know, the angels have quite a lot of power. They've got quite a big shareholding. By the time the VC investment comes along, VCs put lots of things that neither the founders or the angel investors want, things like, you know, liquidation preferences and anti-dilution down round protections and things like that. And at that point, you know, the angels don't have a say at all. You can't veto it. It just is what it is. It's, it's, it's part of the journey. And, and you do as angels lose what little control you have at the start of the journey. Um, but that's fine. It's at that point, your investment's hopefully grown enough that, you know, for VCs to be interested, your 20,000 investment would probably be worth at least 10 times what you put in at the start of the business anyway on a, on a successful exit. So it's, it's yeah, just the cost of doing that. Thanks, also, a bit of uh, we, we took a bit of secondary in um, at Halo. I'm not, not sure where it came, whether it was at the beginning or decided, uh, etc. But I think from an investor point of view, actually, it's not too bad. One is it does keep the, the founder committed and it actually gives them financial, uh, a bit of stability at that time. And also it makes them not go looking to get even a bigger wage in the company as well, because they've got a bit of uh, extra money. So I, but do you do that at the beginning of the agreement or does it come when you get to the VCs, Sam? Yeah, uh, I mean, typically that wouldn't be discussed, mentioned, or, uh, yeah, that, that would not even be, founders wouldn't even probably know about it and investors probably wouldn't know to ask about it. Like I say, a, a seasoned angel would ask for co-sale rights, probably that's the, it's not really a protection, but that balances it for investors. It allows me to benefit to the same extent. But um, uh, yeah, other than that, it wouldn't, it wouldn't enter most people's minds at that point. Thanks, Sam. I've got one other question here from Faisal. Hi Sam, it's a very interesting. Uh, hi, Faisal. hi, okay, uh, very interesting presentation. I we enjoy a lot. Uh, well, I have a question. I was going back to ACIS application. Uh, as you said, one third of the application get rejected. Uh, we, yeah, we all know that. And if you resubmit after making the modification, they tell you why they have been rejected, and what is the success rate for that? I'm sorry, was that, did they tell you why they've been rejected? Yeah, normally, they tell you on the, when they reject your application, they say that this is the reason we, do, we can't give you the advance assurance. And then if you resubmit it uh, after making some modification to comply with the requirements, what is the success rate for that? So, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, so typically, and I do have a slide for this, actually. So let me flip to this. This is kind of the process of, um, yeah, the, the overall process for uh, applying for SEIS, EIS. And, you know, you prepare your pack, obviously, you submit it, HMRC respond, and they can respond in one of four ways. You know, ideally, and you know, we've got a great hit rate here, you'll be granted. Um, they do quite often do conditionally granted these days. So typically it will be where you say, right, I'm going to raise 150 SEIS now, coupled with, a, it's called a dual raise, another 150 EIS. And then in a year, I'm going to raise a million under EIS. And sometimes it's happening increasingly now. HMRC will say, well, we'll give you the 300,000 pounds, the 150, 150. We won't give you the million EIS approval yet. You can reapply for that at a later date. And that's, you know, you kind of shrug and go, that's okay. That's, a, that's kind of a formality at that point. Um, what you can do, and we'll jump to the bottom one, is get a, you know, a query or missing info. And the problem with this one is HMRC either, in our experience, they either rubber stamp an application and say, great, everything's fine. Or what they'll do is they'll find one thing wrong. And then it obviously goes to a different team of reviewers who then goes through it with a fine tooth comb. And they won't just find one thing wrong. They'll raise eight different queries. And you've got to make sure you answer every one of those eight queries in detail. In detail. Otherwise, they'll either re-query or reject you. But, but with a query or missing info, you just go back to the start. You have to resubmit. 
uh, you'll pack once you've made the changes and you know you, the time scales are again between two and 15 days roughly. The rejected is for a catastrophic failure. So um, it is where HMRC are either you can't answer the questions because they just don't think you'll get there or where you've answered a question and they know that you've breached you know the the, the rules and the problem with SEIS EIS is you know the rule that there are lots of rules they're really um, opaque they're not transparent at all and they're really difficult to understand and also HMRC it depends on the day of the week how HMRC interprets some of them um, so as an example, the first 30 times we did an advanced assurance application, one of our documents says, the shareholder agreement says something like, you know, we aim to exit the business in six years or whatever. The founder can put into how many years. It's not a commitment to exit, but it's kind of an indication to the investors of what the plan is. The first 30 times we submitted an advanced assurance, HMRC never queried anything. The 31st time they wrote back and said, can you describe how a desire to exit in six years balances against the long-term growth rule within the advanced assurance. <laughs> and you kind of smile and go, well, hang on, you've ignored it for 30, for the first, but anyway. So on that basis, we've changed our documentation. So that if, if the paperwork's being used for an advanced assurance application, we just, don't, we just don't include that comment because we don't want to answer it. It's worth bringing to life that that person, when HMRC raised a query on that, um, on that startup, we provided an answer which, spoke you know it's not a guarantee of exit it's a potential aspiration and of course every investor is investing on the basis of there being an exit at some point um so that person did get their advance assurance but it's that's just a an example of how hmrc are sometimes inconsistent with the way they um manage the process and the the reviewing process um once you so to, to oh sorry to bring the rest of this to life once you get through the you know uh, once you get through and you get granted or conditionally granted, there are a few other steps. So you need to take on your investment and then you have to go through, there's a bunch of forms you fill in. The company has to send a SEIS one form once a qualifying time or spend has, has been taken. Um, and then they can issue SEIS three forms out to the investor. It's at that point that the investor can claim the tax relief. Exactly. Thank Sorry, you that. very much. Thank you very much, Sam. That's, uh, that's wonderful. And, um, Big thank you to Sam uh, for today. Very much enjoyed that. And uh, is there any 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 last uh, questions at all? No, I don't think there is. So um, that's that's very good, uh, Sam. And uh, thank you once again. And um, we look forward to seeing.